All right, so this is uh, Understanding Your Religion, the seven major doctrines that define Christianity. This is lesson number one in that series, and the title of this lesson is uh, Why Study Doctrine? Why, why even have a class like this? You know, why should we even bother? Because some people say, you know, love is all you need, you know, like the song. Just as long as you love, you don't need anything else. You know, if you love people, pretty much, uh, why study doctrine? Doctrine causes fights, causes division. So I think the first class we, um, we need to talk about or answer that question. Uh, the reason that we do and we say the things that we do and say as Christians, as members of the Church of Christ is because we believe and accept as true certain teachings. Teaching, doctrine, same ideas. So whenever I talk about doctrine, I'm talking about teachings. Whenever I'm talking about teachings, I'm talking about doctrine. And so what we say and do as Christians are based on the things we've been taught, the things that we accept concerning our faith. So how we live our lives, uh, you know, why are we immersed in water instead of sprinkled? Uh, why we use uh, you know, grape juice and uh, you know, crackers for communion, uh, how we feel about death, our attitude, what motivates our effort to control our various human impulses. You know, I want to do this thing and something tells me I shouldn't do that. You know, who tells me I shouldn't do that thing? Or I should be doing something else. So all of these actions and and more are based squarely on the instructions or the quote doctrines we believe come from God contained in the Bible. So a lot of times, however, um, we know and deal more with the end result. In other words, we, we talk more about the actions. You shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. You should do this, you should get into the habit of doing that. You should have this attitude. You know, we, we talk about the end result that is created by the doctrine rather than the doctrine itself. So this class is not going to be, you ought to do this, you should do that, you should try harder. You know, this, this class is not about that. This class is about the why. Why? What teaching have we received and accepted that moves us to that particular action? So we're going to examine the reasons we do what we do and we say what we say. So in this class, we're going to study the great or the fundamental instructions upon which our faith is founded. I mean, in the Bible, you want, you want teachings? You, there's hundreds of them on all kinds of topics. Teachings on the Levitical priesthood, teaching about food laws, teaching about worship, teaching about church organization. I mean, it goes on and on and on and on. You'd think this class would last you know, five years. There's so many teachings in the Bible. In this class, we're going to try to reduce those down to you know, seven major doctrines. There are seven of them upon which our faith is based, and seven that explain pretty much all the others. Okay? So before we begin to study the actual doctrines in an order, order, uh, orderly manner, we should ask ourselves, why is the course important? A couple of reasons for that. The course is important because Jesus commanded it. Because Jesus commanded it. In Matthew 28, 20 to His apostles, He, he, he gives them the great commission you know, to go preach the gospel to all nations. Then He says, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So why should I study doctrine? Well, Jesus says, you need to know it, you need to obey it. So part of the process of making disciples is to teach them the words of Christ and then encourage them to obey it. And I think one of the, you know, the things that we miss out sometimes is we teach the doctrines but we lack the effort of encouraging people to obey the things that they learn. Okay? So we study the doctrines of the Bible to understand God's purpose in sending Jesus and Christ's purpose in sending the apostles. So major Christian doctrine is another way of saying the teachings of Christ. He said, 
teach them all the things that I have commanded you, to obey all the things that I commanded you. So this class here is really a follow-up to what Jesus is saying in Matthew 28. We're trying to teach the church, this group here anyways, the teachings of Christ, the basic teachings of, of Christ. And you know what, you'll be surprised what those are. When I ask people, name me a major Christian doctrine, they'll say, uh, marriage and divorce. Pfft, that's not a major Christian doctrine. It, there's a teaching on marriage and divorce, there is one, but that's not a major Christian doctrine at all. That we should go to church every Sunday, Pfft, that's not a major Christian doctrine. Uh, that, that, that the men should be the one who are elders, that's not a major Christian, that's a teaching, but it's not a major doctrine. So we're also going to kind of, you know, put things into perspective here as to what are major uh, doctrines. Okay, another reason why we study, because there's a lot of false teaching going on. <laughs> you know, there were many early warnings that the method that Satan would use to destroy the church and destroy the faith of many was through the teaching of false doctrine. In Romans 16, 17 and 18, uh, Paul is saying, for such men are slaves not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites, and by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. During that time, there were many who purposefully taught false things to confuse the brethren. And it was one of the things that I found really difficult to accept. Uh, maybe I was just uh, naive. I always found it difficult to accept that there are people in the world that actually teach wrong things and they know they're teaching wrong things. And they're doing it in order to profit or to get power or to have you know, some sort of hold over people or, or they don't care. I always approach the thing, everyone's sincere, I guess they're just making a sincere mistake. And, and, and yes, of course, I mean, you know, the, we all make mistakes. I make, everybody makes mistakes. Even in teaching, we make mistakes. That's why we should study the word and continue to do so in order to you know, grow in our knowledge. But there are some people who actually do it in order to confuse, as Paul says, and to deceive the hearts of the, of the unsuspecting. And how are we to test if we don't know? Well, you know, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, John says we are to test the spirits. Test the spirits. You know, spirits meaning the prophets, the teachers. Test them. And how do we test them? Well, we, we test them by figuring out, you know, the first question I ask, somebody knocks at the door, wants to talk to me about religion, uh, especially about the Christian religion, the first thing I ask them, who is Jesus? I don't ask them what church you go to and what do you believe, I just ask them, who is Jesus? Because that's always the beginning of the false doctrine. It's all, it always begins with who Christ is. Well, he's this, he's that, you know, he's something less than God or he's something, he's God but he's not man, he's man but he's not God, he, he, he didn't suffer as a man, he, you know, his, his spirit left his body before the crucifixion, you know, there are all kinds of variation on who Jesus is. So from the very beginning, the Bible tells us, you know, test the spirits. Not everybody is out there purposefully telling the truth. Some are trying to do damage. In 2 Timothy 4.3, Paul says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrines, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their desires. People often want to hear what pleases them instead of the truth. And in our society today, probably the thing that is most evident in that uh, is the, in the gay rights movement. You, know, you, have the, the, you have churches that now accept and perform uh, weddings between men or weddings between women, you know, gay weddings. And, and, and that's, that puts a sign that says, you know, gays are welcome here. They're welcome without change. They're welcome uh, in pursuing their own personal lifestyle. We won't say anything about that from the pulpit. It's actually okay. 
Well, of course, we, you know, someone who struggles with same-sex issues, homosexual, they're welcome here too. We'll love them, encourage them, support them, but we won't support the lifestyle. We'll encourage them to deal with that as a sinful um, impulse using all the tools that God gives us to deal with any sinful impulse. So it's nothing new you know, that religious leaders will compromise what the scriptures say in order to please a particular, a particular group. I mean, that's a, that's a big one, but you know, sometimes preachers won't call on the sin that the richest guy in the church is happen, happening to be guilty of. Maybe the guy who puts in the biggest money in the pot on Sunday has a girlfriend. That's a bit of an open secret. I mean, this is aside from his wife. And nobody will say anything because they don't want to jeopardize. You know. That might be a little closer to home sometimes. We won't call the things from the pulpit that are going on with members who perhaps are powerful or rich or perhaps have leadership positions. Second Timothy chapter two, verse 16, it says, but avoid worldly and empty chatter for it will lead to further ungodliness and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus. So false teachers spread false information about existing facts in order to produce confusion. In my experience, you know, a false idea starts in a classroom, an idea, one gets it, another one gets it. I remember when I was working at Oklahoma Christian, they wanted to do small groups. Small groups became the big thing all of a sudden. Everybody was wanting to be in a small group. You know. So they started these small groups, you know, uh, independent, uh, anybody who wanted a small group could have one in their dorm room or in whatever, and they had you know, dozens of small groups. Nobody was in charge, nobody was overseeing it. You know. And it was going for a while until all of a sudden one of the small groups started speaking in tongues. <laughs> Lo and behold, oh, we've got the gift. And, and that spread to another group. And you know, the elders and the leaders had to step in and say, whoop, stop. Let's sit down. Let's talk. Let's study the scripture. Just like a lie, you know, the old story, a lie has, you know, it goes around the world before the truth has got a chance to put their pants on, something like that. Same thing with bad doctrine, bad teaching. It starts sometimes innocently, an idea, discussion, but boy, when it takes off, it really takes off. And if you're in a congregation that don't have elders or experienced leaders, you know, a lot of times that's the demise of that church. It'll create division. Then in Acts chapter 20, he says, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which He purchased with His own blood. He says, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. So Paul in the very first century, just as the church is established, not many years after its establishment, he warns the existing leadership that even church leaders will be guilty of this sin, either by ignorance or malice. Be on guard, he says, even from your, never mind people coming in from the outside, be on guard, people from the inside will you know, fall away. Remember we talked about that, apostasy. Apostasy is falling away from an existing standard. There'll be an apostasy. So we need to study doctrine so we can know the difference between what is correct and what is false. We need to know it for ourselves because we're bombarded by ideas. Today, we have access to more information in 10 minutes than 50 years or 100 years ago than people had access to in their entire lifetime. Into, you know, I had a, a theological question I was asking myself the other day you know, about, the, about you know, the nature of God, the Trinity. You know, it was a kind of a complex idea. I don't want to go into it. Just the idea. So I, just, I went to Google and I typed in not just a word. I typed in an entire long you know, 15 word sentence explaining the question that I was asking concerning the Trinity and the nature of God and so on. A big long sentence. Boop. Bang. You know, a whole list of papers, websites, 
thesis, whatever, you know, that address that very question. I mean, you know, 50 years ago, you had to go to the library and get a book and look at the microfiche. Remember, anybody know even what that means? Microfiche, you know, and you'd have to hunt and hunt and hunt. I, and I've got more material to read on it than I, than I have time. So we are bombarded with so much information today. We need to understand our own religion and the t basic teachings of our religion if we're not just carried away. So Jesus said, you know, the, 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 the best way to examine teaching is to compare it to His own words because it will be His word that will judge in the end. And He says that, he who rejects me does not receive my sayings as one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him on the last day. We want to be confident in judgment. It's not just a question of morality. People who are not, people who are not confident of their religion it's not, or of their salvation, it's not because the, uh, the morality of their lives is high or low. The blood of Christ wipes away all sins, small ones and big ones. Usually they're unsure of their salvation because they're unsure of the doctrine, the teaching. They're not solid in the teaching. If you're solid in the teaching, then you're solid also in your confidence. And if you're solid in your confidence about your salvation, you have the courage to do things and say things and step out. You see, you live courageously because you're standing on a firm foundation. All right, another reason we study doctrine, uh, and I've mentioned it already, false doctrine causes problems in our personal lives as well as our corporate lives. For example, it divides us. Again, Paul says, if anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing, but he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words, out of which arise envy and strife, abusive language, evil suspicion and, and constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. And so Paul, in, I mean, unequivocally, right? I mean, there's, he's not mincing any words here. You know, it divides the church. People will align with different teachers and these will be fighting among the brethren over the false teaching. Why do you think why do you think in our Bible, pro, not in the children's classes, it's exactly the opposite. In the children's classes, we want stability. It's a good thing that those wonderful, mostly women, those wonderful sisters in Christ invest years, many times, teaching certain classes. Why do we allow them to stay there and encourage them? Because we want stability in that portion of our program. The kids come, they go from one class, they have sister so-and-so who teaches them, and then they, they go to the next class, they look forward to having the next teacher because that teacher's been there and they're excited you know, for class change. Stability and having the same personnel there builds trust and confidence in children. This is a safe place, this is a good place. And God bless all those wonderful people that work in that program. In the adult side, we do it a little differently. We mix it up constantly. Why? We don't want one teacher teaching the same people all the time. We want people to be exposed to different people, different teachers, different points of view to expand their minds, to expand their understanding. Every teacher has a style. You know, people say, oh, well, you and Marty, you're so different in your style. I understand what they're saying. I'm lecture style, that's just you know, 36 years of preaching, this is my style, it's what I do. Marty, he's discussion style, he's comfortable in that, he's good at that too, he, he knows how to just get people talking and, and keep the thread of the idea going you know, all the way through and then manage to wrap it up at the end. That's, that's a skill that he has that I, I don't necessarily possess, but that's okay, you all get a chance to be in my class sometimes, his class, Dayton, probably the, the guy who knows the Bible the best in the entire church. You know? We want people to be exposed to his wisdom and his understanding and his knowledge and other adult teachers that we have, uh, have as well. All right, um, why study uh, doctor, false doctrine causes problems. 
Uh, it divides, it also makes us prisoners of false ideas. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 4, Paul says, but it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. He's talking about legalists who came into the Galatian church and began teaching that you, know, you had to go back and obey the law for circumcision and food laws and so on and so forth if you wanted to be a Christian. Those teachers wanted people to do what they said they had to do. You know, Christians had been set free from the, 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 the requirements of the law. Why? Because Jesus fulfilled all those requirements. And through faith in Him and obedience to Him, we also fulfill all the requirements of the law. Why do we continue to do so? Because we walk by faith now. And they had teachers that came in and said, no, 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 no. If you're going to be a good Christian, you need to be circumcised. And then you, you, you know, no pork and this and that. You need to keep all the traditions and stuff like that if you want to be a good Christian. And because they seemed mature and they seemed intelligent, people went along with that. But Paul here, he says, well, they sneaked in to spy out our liberty, our freedom. Uh, let me tell you, most false teaching within Christianity usually try to control what you eat your intimate sexual life, and sometimes how you dress. Now I want to tell you, those three things, those are not major doctrines. But they're usually systems and methods that people use in order to gain control over people. Colossians chapter 2 verse 8. He says, see to it, remember now, he's talking to whole different groups here. That's why I selected different scriptures. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. We become prisoners of false ideas. I, I, I'm, I'm working on an article you know, uh, uh, talking about uh, the freedom that we have in Jesus, you know, Christianity, the religion of freedom. And the first thing that came to my mind when I thought of this idea is that there are no dress requirements for Christianity. <laughs> you don't have to wear a veil, you don't have to wear a skull cap, you don't have to wear orange uh, chiffon, you don't have to buzz your head, you don't have to let your hair grow long, you don't have to wear a, a nose ring, you don't have to, there are no dress requirements. You can dress the way you want. What, the only rule in Christianity is what? Well, modesty, that's all, modesty. You can wear red or green or orange. You can <laughs> t-shirt or full length suit. You can dress the way you want. Because we're free in Christ. And usually false teachers come in and try to put us into bondage, into some sort of bondage, as I was mentioning before. Empty philosophy, principles according to the world. In other words, what the world thinks we should be doing rather than according to Christ. And when he says according to Christ, he means rather than according to what Christ taught. Remember, I'm making a case for why should we even be studying these doctrines? Why should we put time into it? And then in another place, he says, for among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins. In other words, have you not ever met someone? They're always feeling guilty. They're guilty, guilty, guilty. They've been, it's okay if you've been a Christian three months, but if you've been a Christian 30 years and you still feel guilty, that's not a psychological problem. That's a doctrinal problem. The whole point about Christianity is not to feel guilty, because if your sins are forgiven, guess what? You shouldn't feel guilty. So he says, uh, women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. What truth? The truth of Christ's teachings. That's the truth. So in all these passages that I've read, in each instance, Paul refers to Christians who are made slaves of some form of religious tradition or authority or practice that is based on false teaching and whose only purpose is to enslave the Christian who may not know the truth. You know, Satan's best weapon against us Christians 
you know, I don't think anybody in here is going to be seduced by Satan to go out and rob a bank or to go into prostitution. You know what I'm saying? I think we're, if I'm looking over this crowd, I don't think we're going to be seduced into doing those kind of things, right? I mean, nobody's perfect. We, we, we have our own struggles, but you know, we're not going to throw away our entire Christian life by doing the big ones, right? But what he does do is he spoils whatever you've got. You're forgiven, you're free in Christ, you have a true and abiding hope for a better life. God is, you know, what, what more can God do to convince you and I that He loves us? The cross, I mean, think. Would any one of us give up one of our children to save people that hate us? Would you sacrifice, let me put it to you in today's terms, would you take your firstborn child, that would be you, right? and kill that child in order to save people in Boko Haram or the terrorists uh, you know, who, who, who went in Kenya recently and murdered Christians. Would you do that? Would you sacrifice your own child to save Islamic terrorists? I don't think so. Well, essentially that's what God did. What more does He have to do to let us know He loves us? And yet somehow Satan is able to suck all the joy out of our Christian life. How? Exactly in this way. By creeping in and planting ideas, false ideas into our minds and hearts that don't destroy our faith, but kind of you know, we, we, gets it out of focus, robs us of any joy that we should be having day after day after day. So knowing the truth, correct doctrine makes you free and it protects the church from division caused by false teachers. All right, a few things uh, before we're almost done. Um, there are not only negative reasons for studying doctrine, there are also great benefits that come from knowing the major doctrines of the Bible. So you know, I've been a little negative here, let's go over to the positive side. So correct doctrine leads to salvation. Paul says, you, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. You cannot be saved properly without knowing the true and correct doctrine about salvation. Nobody gets to heaven by mistake. Now, I've mentioned this before in a lesson, you know, like in the movies, the guy goes to sleep and then oh, he wakes up and goes, oh, where am I? I? I'm in heaven. You're in heaven. Really? Oh, wow. How did I get here? No, 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 no. That's in the movies. <laughs> yeah. Those who are going to heaven, they know they're going to heaven. And they know why they're going to heaven. And they know how they're going to heaven. They know. And why do they know? Because they've been taught correctly about the doctrine of Salvation, so you can't be saved properly without actually knowing the true and correct doctrine about salvation. Another thing uh, that correct doctrine gives us, it equips us to serve God. You know, Paul says, all scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God, and here man, woman of God, may be adequate, equipped for every good work. We are saved so that we can serve the living God and correct doctrine teaches us how to please and serve Him. How do I, isn't that a question that we all ask ourselves from time to time? God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? How can I please you? I, I want to please you. Well, correct doctrine will give you insight on how you can serve Him and, and, and please Him. And then of course, Correct doctrine transforms us into the image of Christ. 1 Timothy 1.5 says, but the goal of our instruction. Okay, oh, what's the goal of our teaching, our doctrine? The goal is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So you know people who say, hey, you don't need doctrine. You know, love, love is all about it. Love is all you need. Well, that's the goal, love. But you can't get there without correct doctrine. You can't get to the kind of love that God wants us to experience and to share without the avenue of correct doctrine that will eventually lead us to that 
role in our lives or that status or that experience in our life. So knowing the words of Christ, sowing them correctly into our hearts will produce a Christ-like heart, a Christ-like character, a change that will honor God and provide um, uh, true witness to other people. Um, being like Jesus is not a burden, it's release. The more of myself that I can jettison, that I can let go, my sinful self, my selfish self, my egotistical self, my depressed self, my you know, I want my own way self, my own mean-spirited self, you know, the more I can kind of rid myself of that and fill the empty space with Christ, the happier I become, the more at peace I become, and the more able I am to love other people well, first of all, to love myself. The hard thing about loving myself is I don't like me to do that much, because when I really look at myself, I go, man, alive, how am I ever going to get to heaven? But as I develop a Christian character, God makes a believer out of me, because He changes my character. Without true doctrine, we cannot know God, we can't come to Christ, we can't be sure of our salvation, so yes, it's important. Okay, one last thing, a little outline of what we're going to do. There are a lot of instructions or doctrines that the Bible teaches, but the title of this course is Understanding Your Religion, the Seven Major Doctrines That Define the Christian Faith. So I've tried to select doctrines that best represent the entire instruction given in the Bible. In other words, these are the doctrines that cover the Bible from start to finish. There can be some dispute about this. I'm not saying that I'm the final authority on this. But I've been thinking about it a long time. So here, there, here are the seven. The seven doctrines. The doctrine of the inspiration of the Bible. The doctrine of the deity of Christ. The doctrine of original goodness. The doctrine of the fall of man. The doctrine of restoration. The doctrine of the kingdom. And the doctrine of the seven coming, uh, second coming. If you're familiar with these doctrines, then you will be familiar with all the sub-teachings that are generated by these doctrines and you will be much more knowledgeable about why and how you practice your faith. Note also that there is no doctrine of the existence of God here or the existence of a supreme being and the reason why there's no doctrine of that is because the Bible assumes this as fact and does not have a specific teaching about the reality of God. You read, read from Genesis to Revelation, there's no teaching there arguing about there is a God and He is real. The Bible begins with the assumption, in the beginning, God. Boom. It doesn't explain it, doesn't defend it, it just says, in the beginning, God. So there's no, quote, doctrine of the existence of God. That's why it's not in the list. All right. That's our first class. Hope we got off to a good start.